for 2019. Um, but I think what's been key is whether you believe in stakeholder capitalism or not, what's absolutely true is that uh, a company looking for its long-term business prospects, its long-term shareholder value, certainly has to be thinking about issues like the environment and its people and the communities in which it operates. We don't have a, you know, our license to operate in any country isn't uh, something that's handed down from heaven. It's something you've got to earn and you've got to earn it every day. And you earn it in part by being committed, uh, not just to achieving superior financial results, which is um, obviously important, but also in doing what's necessary to create that kind of long-term value for the community, the people you work with, your customers, your suppliers, um, and the environment as a whole. And I think more and more companies have evolved in that direction. Um, there's more and more of a consensus. The question is how to do it. And I've been privileged to be at MasterCard for the last three years, where this has been deep in our DNA for the last 12 years in terms of our commitment to financial inclusion. And it's really been a key part of what we focus on. And this has been a really big opportunity in terms of expanding uh, financial inclusion during the pandemic, no? Absolutely. I think the combination of uh, COVID, the collapse of small business, um, and then, of course, in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world, the issues around racial equity that came to the fore really challenged co companies to figure out what they were going to do to address these issues. For us, it's just as an example, we work with more than 100 governments all over the world um, over the last uh, uh, year and a half to help them deliver COVID benefits, for example, to individuals, uh, making sure that individuals are connected to the digital economy, can receive those benefits, um, and, can, and those benefits can be used um, to, to help them achieve greater financial security. And then similarly, for micro and small businesses, many of whom really faced an existential threat with COVID and had to move from being mom and pop, brick and mortar businesses to going online, engaging in e-commerce, sometimes for the first time, uh, creating a web presence, getting being able to be paid safely and securely, being able to stay in touch with their customers and, and their suppliers, uh, being able to get access to, to capital, to, to, to loans, to continue to, to grow their business. All of that really underscored the importance of being included in the digital economy. Do your employees share your vision? So you have a corporate vision, which you have just, you know, outlined, and then you know, you, you try to execute that, but do your employees and how do you get them to buy into this big vision that's so important? Well, first, it does take leadership at the top. And, and the fact that our our CEO, Ajay Banga, and now Michael Meebach have been very committed to financial inclusion. This is not something that's new to us. Um, I think in many ways, uh, uh, other companies have sort of come to the same conclusion that we came to a decade or so ago, which is that it's in our interest to bring 500 million unbanked individuals into the financial system. It's not only the right thing to do, but we're we're seeding the markets of the future. We're creating that path towards greater financial security. And we treat it like any other goal of the company. Every region has its targets. Every country has its programs. Five years ago, we set out this goal to bring half a billion unbanked individuals into the financial system. We achieved it nine months ahead of time in the middle of COVID. And we looked around and came to the conclusion that COVID underscored more than ever just how important it was to be connected to the digital economy. So we, we doubled down. We raised the goal to a billion individuals. We committed to bringing 50 million micro and small businesses into the digital economy and to uh, serve 25 million women, additional women-owned, women-run businesses and help them uh, succeed in the digital economy economy and we're on track to do all of those things so all the employees are involved they love doing this it's 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 genuine to the company it's something that leverages off of our broader commercial footprint um, uh, in the midst of covid we had literally hundreds of volunteers from different parts of the company wanting to get involved in our in our covid response or our response to small business and response to racial equity uh, issues we have a big volunteer program. Everyone can take five days off uh, over the course of the year and, and volunteer. 
In addition to that, we've had um, really dozens of employees go and spend a month, for example, with the World Food Program and work with the World Food Program on its programs uh, in country. And those are just a couple of the examples. Um, we've got employees who volunteer. We have something called uh, uh, Girls for Tech, where we've now served over a million girls in 41 countries, uh, introducing them to, to various science and tech uh, uh, skills. And we're heading towards 5 million girls by, by 2025. And that's all done with volunteer hours from our employees. That's an amazing um, vision. Um, and you're bringing it to life. How do you, by engaging your employees in, in this strategy, so how does this, I mean, you have this amazing vision, you have a business, what's the intersection of the two, of the business strategy and then this strategy, which is also a business strategy unto itself? Well, absolutely. I like that. Yeah, it sounds uh, too much like a, a bumper sticker, but we truly believe in the proposition of doing well by doing good, and that you you can you can do good things for the community and for the underserved, um, and in doing that, you are helping grow the business as well. Um, you know, don't don't tell anybody, but I've got the I view myself as having the best job in the company because. Uh, my mandate is to really look across all of the assets of the company from the purely commercial, our products and services and technology to our humanitarian development uh, work to our purely philanthropic, our, our, uh, our foundation, our Center for Inclusive Growth, and to bring all of it together to show how we can have an impact on the biggest social and economic challenges uh, facing the markets in which we operate and do so at the same time as achieving great financial and economic results. And and the impact, I guess we talked to mention this a little bit earlier, but the pandemic has just pushed everything, rolled everything forward, no? Absolutely. It's accelerated trends that were already underway, the trend towards greater digitalization of payments, of people getting out of cash and relying more on, on digital technology going online, doing more online commerce, that we've seen almost a 100% increase in online commerce. Um, and um, it, it is really, uh, but at the same time, that's underscored just how important it is to ensure that as people go digital, as businesses go digital, we're not creating new digital divides, that we're making sure that the digital economy serves everybody. And that's really important coming out of this crisis. Do you worry that, um as we come out of this crisis, people are going to be so anxious to go back and have personal interactions that some of the progress we've made in e-commerce and the digital economy will go backwards and, and people will want to, you know, buy um, in the store. I guess that doesn't matter for MasterCard because you can use the card anyway, right? Well, abso absolutely. And look, I think people are eager to go back and and go to their local favorite store and their local favorite restaurant and that's terrific that is the strength of our of our community is really those small businesses we probably have gained an appreciation for them through covid even stronger than we had uh, than we had before uh, but i think people have also gotten used to paying by their phone paying by their card paying online and i don't think that's going to necessarily uh, uh necessarily go go backwards so You've gained an appreciation for your uh, clients. Have they gained an appreciation for you, do you think, throughout this? Well, I hope so. We, we <laughs> certainly have been out there working with, uh, you know, not just our bank customers, but our the fintechs, the merchant community, uh, doing everything we can to try and help them get through, uh, try to help get them through this crisis. And, uh, you know, for example, one of the challenges of going online becoming more digital is of course you're you've got to make sure you can do so safely and protected from cyber threats from uh, fraudulent activity and so we like work with merchants to help them with that as well to ensure that they're protected as they're going uh, online particularly important for small businesses who don't have huge it departments to, to help uh, uh, to help uh, protect their business and so anything that we can do to help them succeed is is in our interest uh, as well. 
Do you educate them? I'm sorry to go off script a little bit. Do you educate them on cybersecurity and how to keep data and payments safe? And and can you talk a little Absolutely. bit about that? Because I think that's yeah, so no, it's a key part of our key part of our our, our overall effort with uh, uh, with with merchants, businesses, as well as with banks and and fintechs and governments is to help them uh, with cybersecurity. We've got the ability, for example, to from the outside, do an assessment of uh, how vulnerable you are to cyber attack, and then to help, of course, to try and address those uh, vulnerabilities. Um, you know, our ability to see transactions all over the world allows us to spot fraud or to spot cyber attacks wherever they might emerge. When you, when you begin to see these patterns, you know, somebody in, in, uh, in Peru, somebody in Nigeria, somebody in Ukraine, you see this transaction, you say, this looks fraudulent, uh, or this looks like it's a new form of cyber attack. Being able to see those transactions globally allows us to help locally small businesses and banks uh, address their address their vulnerabilities. This is so important because, as you know better than I, it's very costly to protect okay. against cybersecurity and everything else. And so um, if you can help them then they have the protections. If not, um, they don't because they can't Absolutely. afford it. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in we're talking about Latin America and the Caribbean. Can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, what you've done in Latin America, what you've done in the Caribbean? Um, how do you see what's, what's happening in, in, in those markets at this point? Well, it's a it's a very vibrant market and one that we're really committed to. Um, and so, for example, we have a program called Digital Allies, which really takes all of our assets to small businesses and helps them succeed um, uh, uh, online and in the digital economy. Uh, but we've also worked with with USAID as an example um, to help create a uh, an incubator for women owned businesses. Uh, I'm sure you know the figures, but women get such a small portion, women founders get such a small portion of venture capital anywhere in the world. Uh, right. But I believe in Latin America and Europe, it's about 1%. And so uh, working with USAID, uh, we started something called Start Path Empodera, which is building on our Start Path program, which is an incubator for fintech companies um, to, it, to really find and support women in Colombia uh, to, to grow their businesses. We have a terrific uh, um, initiative throughout Latin America called Tech for Good, where the Tech for Good Alliance is bringing together lots of fintechs as well as banks and, and other partners to really focus on what they could do to have positive social impact across Latin America while doing it on a very importantly on a commercially sustainable basis. And we have a theory of the case, which is that Government can't do it alone. Philanthropy can't do it alone. Both are absolutely critical, but that if we're ultimately going to be able to address the challenges that we face, economic and social challenges that we face, we've got to mobilize the private sector at scale. And that means it's got to be commercially sustainable. And that's uh, an area that we work on um, a lot in, uh, in Latin America uh, as well. And I, I see that the IDB is a, a uh, partner of, uh, of, of the council, of course, and of this event. Uh, we do a lot of work with them, including in the Caribbean, looking at uh, uh, tourism and providing our data analytics, our data insights to help the governments in the Caribbean uh, prepare for and rebuild tourism after COVID so that we can help them identify where tourists are coming from, um, who spends money on what. German tourists spend money on on uh, uh, hotels, uh, Chinese on uh, uh, on goods, Americans on food, and so that they can use their tourism promotion dollars to, and the, the, as as well as they can, to help promote uh, the rebuilding of tourism after this crisis. Those are just a few examples. So, data analytics is what you're providing them, which is also crucial to to their future. No, another thing where you need a lot of scale to really be able to do this. Absolutely, and and you know it's really important that that uh, companies like us approach this with privacy at, at the core. That 
We're, we're not providing personal information. We're not selling personal information as an individual. Our view is you own your data. You should benefit from your data. You control it. Our job is to protect it. Um, but as we can come up with analytics based on the transactions that we see, we can provide those sorts of insights to, 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 to merchants, to banks, to governments, to help them do their job better. So, um, you know, there have been many challenges created by the pandemic, um, Mike, and challenges within your company, it, with, within your clients, um, travel has been limited. Um, how has is, how is MasterCard really adapted to, to meet those challenges um, in, in an everyday sense? Well, first and foremost, we have to look after our people and making sure that they are uh, safe and healthy and that are, they're able to, to address and manage the challenges they face in their everyday life. That's, that's our number one uh, priority. And like every company, like every institution, you know, we've been touched by this as well. We've had tragic losses um, in, in different places around the world, but we are really focused on making sure that we're serving our, our, our employees and their families first and foremost. And then it's really working with our, our clients, uh, our, the communities in which we operate, our customers, um, our partners, and making sure we're doing everything we can to help them get through this and, uh, and, to, um, and to succeed. You know, across Latin America, um, uh, last year we partnered with, with Argentina, with uh, uh, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico to help deliver COVID benefits to about 40 million people who were effectively unbanked or, or underserved. And so uh, partnering with them to help them do, to provide those government services efficiently, effectively in the age of COVID, making sure individuals are able to get access to the, so the resources they need to achieve financial security. Um, that's a key part of what we've been, we've been doing. There are a few countries I, I noticed, countries as diverse as Belarus, Israel and Chile all had the situation where pensioners would have to go to an office, post office or some other office, uh, once a month to collect a check. And of course, you couldn't do that in COVID. And, and this were sometimes populations that weren't terribly used to being online, uh, weren't necessarily digitally connected. And we worked in all three of those countries to help them migrate those pension payments to a card, along with a lot of education, so that those pensioners were able to, to maintain those resources, maintain that financial security, and now have the ability to engage in the digital economy as well. That's amazing. I mean, how, how, how impressive, right, to be able to, you know, have a card loaded with your pension, with the money that you take out of the pension system. Automatically reloaded every, every, uh, every month to be able to use it online as well as in stores or, uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and, and to see pensioners who maybe had no experience with e-commerce now feeling more and more comfortable with doing, with being there. So you previously mentioned gender gaps, and we were talking a little bit about that before. Um, and I know women have been the most impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. They've, um, you know, they it already highlighted many of the existing issues that that women have about being in the workforce. More women had to withdraw from the workforce. It's harder for women to go back um, into the workforce right now because schools aren't open, there isn't childcare. Um, how can the private sector deal with this issue and really use this pandemic um, to move the needle forward for women? And, um, you know, what do you think is critical to getting women back into the workforce, back integrated? And maybe we can start with your company and then talk right. about um, your view on um, the private sector around the world doing the same. Well, I think look, I think that's right. And, and we've seen that, that women, uh, uh, minorities uh, have tended to bear the brunt of COVID and the, the, the impact. Um, and as you said, you got to start with the company first. And so we're very, very focused internally on ensuring uh, pay equity and ensuring equal opportunity. And 
and you know, you ask, how do you motivate employees? Um, you know, part of it is that top-down leadership, but it's also incentivizing. So this year, uh, we are we've announced that uh, we're going to be paying our senior executives on metrics tied to ESG, and the E has to do with carbon neutrality on our path to net zero, and the S is a metric around financial inclusion, uh, bringing 85 to 95 million people around the world into the digital economy. Um, and the G is about gender equity and closing the gender pay equity gap uh, within the company. And so that's something that everybody in the company can play a role in. Anybody who's hiring people, promoting people, they can very much keep that in mind. And that's part of our culture of, of decency within the company. Then when I think you look outside, every company will find their own ways of contributing. You know, for us, as I mentioned, we committed to bring 25 million women entrepreneurs into the digital economy over the next five years. We're on track for, for doing that. Um, we have focused on uh, women founders of startups and trying to bridge the really significant financing gap. You know, by some estimates, 70% of women-owned businesses face a, a financing gap, can't get access to capital that they need to, to thrive and to uh, expand. You know, that program in, in, in Colombia, Starpath, Empradera, that's one way of doing it. We've also been working with the IDB on their program called Growing Together, which is really about helping women-owned businesses integrate into foreign trade and, and regional value chains. And so we should all be looking for areas where we can have an impact and have an impact that relates back to the business. For us to have every business person across Latin America looking for ways of bringing in um, underserved individuals, helping women-owned micro and small businesses get access to capital, helping them plug into regional and global value chains. That's how we ultimately will have an impact. So people have been working from home. Uh, one of the hardest issues I think for companies has been keeping people motivated, keeping employees motivated. Um, how did you do that? And what role do you think a company's culture plays in that process? Um, let's start there. Yeah, look, I think, uh, I think one of the interesting things coming out of this crisis is that uh, companies, employers have generally gotten pretty good marks from their employees for uh, how they dealt with COVID. And at a time when there's been a lot of distrust of other institutions, and people weren't sure where to look for information, um, most companies really went out of their way to over-communicate, to communicate whatever they, they could, uh, and to help their employees make this transition. And I think we're all in this together. One thing I found uh, uh, really interesting is, you know, we're spending so much time on, on Zoom and other platforms together. We've gotten to know each other's homes and families and exactly. kids running around in the back. Don't forget um, dogs. And they dogs, can. a lot of, a lot of, of the sharing of dogs. Um, uh, but we've also, I think, become much more connected with each other's uh, personal lives, much more empathetic. You know, we know what's going on with the health situation of our, of our colleagues and uh, people are volunteering and opening up and becoming more vulnerable. And I think I think uh, I'm hopeful that as we come out of this, we return to office uh, for a larger, larger portion of our time, that we're going to be able to maintain that. For us as a company, we we uh, you know we we uh, our, our former CEO uh, started something a few years ago called the, the decency quotient. Uh, he started talking oh, about it. So you know beyond uh, IQ and EQ, it's DQ and it really goes to how you treat each other and, um, and and each other and your customers, your communities, but really putting decency at the core of our culture. And that has shown through throughout this experience with COVID. And uh, I think we'll end up coming out of it through the other end uh, even stronger as a result. So you think culture um, and, and the existing culture of the company is critical or has been critical um, in this kind of virtual environment. Absolutely. I think also the, the, the willingness and the ability to 
to react quickly where there's a need. And we have we have several thousand employees in India, and the situation in India is so dire. And uh, we really mobilized an emergency effort, kind of a crisis management effort internally, committed ten million dollars uh, quite rapidly to building hospitals, getting oxygen uh, generators into India. Um, not just for our, our employees and our families, but the communities in which they live, uh, because we saw the dire need. And I think that was very much appreciated by our employees. And we do that all over the world to one extent or another as needs arise. And in your opinion, um, I mean, you have a diverse, diverse culture, You're, you operate around the world. Um, how critical is it for you to really build on that diverse culture and, and really build this you know, inclusive workforce um, which brings, you know, diverse perspectives and experiences to the table in, in making your business decisions. Look, it's absolutely critical, and you, you answered it in your question. It's really having those diverse perspectives around the table. Um, maybe it's because we're a global company, and if you look at our management committee, it is very diverse. Uh, uh, it's from all over the world, uh, and we benefit from that. We benefit from having all those alternative perspectives. And when we look here in the United States where there are particular issues around um, uh, African-Americans, Latinx, women, making sure that we're doing everything uh, possible to, uh, in, to recruit, retain, promote, and ensure that, um, that there are diverse voices around the table as we're making business decisions, it makes us a better company. Has your view on that changed because of the pandemic or the corporate view changed on what constitutes diversity and different voices at the table? I don't think so. I think we were pretty committed to it for a long time. And uh, I think it was a strength through the pandemic because we had those diverse voices at the table. So perhaps it's reinforced and underscored the importance, but it's not, it's not new to us. I'm going to ask you a totally different question for a second. So you, in the Obama administration, you really did a number of trade deals, promoted trade. How do we get more women into the value chain as we as we move forward? I mean, in a sense, we've talked a little bit about that, but this is so critical um, to to making life better for women and families. Like I think first you have to start with how do we get more small and medium sized businesses into the value chains because there's so many obstacles, so much friction in the system. I should have started with the right one. But, but I'm going to get to your question too, because I think uh, the one, making it easier for small and medium sized businesses to integrate themselves, make it easier at the border, um, like getting rid of some of the friction, digitizing. We, we've been looking at freight and, and, and trade and what happens at borders, what happens at ports. There is so much manual processing of paper, uh, so many payments to be made oftentimes, you know, by cash, you know, those ship captains carrying suitcases of cash to pay port fees and things of that sort. That is highly inefficient and it's, been a, it's a real deterrent to small businesses getting involved. But then when you look at small businesses, You've got countries where women don't have the same access to property, to own a business, to get access to capital, to get access to loans. And that's why it's so important that we, you know, we have a particular focus on how do we include the women small business owners into those value chains. Uh, we do a lot of work with, with Axion as one example. Our, our CEO is on the board of Axion. They're a major partner of ours with the MasterCard Impact Fund. One thing they've been doing is working to upgrade the technology of microfinance institutions around the world to make it easier for women and other um, small business owners to get access to capital. I think the more we can digitize, the more we can take the inefficiencies and the friction out of the system, the more likely it's to benefit those who are most excluded. And, and that's why we're so focused on on really making the digital economy work for everyone everywhere and making it truly inclusive and sustainable. Will blockchain technology help this? I think you know we, we view ourselves as a what we call a multi-rail or multi-network 
company. We're not just a card company. You know, I, I often say Apple's not a fruit, Amazon's not a river, MasterCard is not a credit card company. We're a technology company that grew up in the in the payment space. And whether it's you know credit and debit and prepaid cards or uh, bank to bank account to bank account transfers, uh, we or ultimately blockchain uh, and and uh, cryptocurrencies, all of those might play or could play a very important role uh, in in some part of commerce or another, and we're committed to playing in all of them. That's great. So maybe we should start to take some questions from the audience, if that's okay with you. Sure. And um, our first question is going to come from Juan Carlos Chavez from Bank of America. So Juan Carlos, we're going to elevate you and let you um, ask your question. Turn on your camera, Juan Carlos, please. And unmute. Sure. Perfect. Uh, hello, Michael. Hello, Susan. Uh, Great, great. You touch, Michael, you touch so many aspects from uh, inclusion, from cryptocurrencies. So le le let me put it in this way. I hope that we have learned something from this pandemic. And if, if you were to say, how do we make it sustainable down the road after we pass this in terms of including women, sustainability, environmental? Where would you place it? What would be your strategy? Because there's so much. You said small mom and pops onboarding them, but then we have new technologies, digital assets. What would be your starting point? What would be your view? We must have learned something from this pandemic. It's a, look, it's a great question, Juan Carlos. I think, I think having the perspective of uh, inclusive by design, and what I mean by that, it can be everything from technology to product to services to business strategy, that if one of the fundamental principles that you're always asking yourself and your colleagues is, is this going to be pro-inclusivity? What is this going to do to be inclusive? And, by, and, and of course, the flip side, is there anything in this product? Is there anything in this AI algorithm? Is there anything in this data analytics product that is somehow reinforcing bias or reinforcing exclusivity? Let's address it. I think it's being quite intentional about it. And I think if, if we are, and we sort of view that as one of our first principles, uh, we will make progress. And um, but that's sort of how we approach things, which is, and how do we, everything that we do, um, uh, every new product, every new service, every new initiative, how is it going to advance the cause of a sustainable and inclusive digital economy? And if we keep that front of mind, I, I, I have to think that over time we're going to see, you know, even more progress going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great, By the way, great. I should say, you're, you're from Bank of America. Bank of America worked with us. Uh, we just issued a $600 million sustainability bond, and Bank of America was our advisor. So one of the first bonds that deals not just with economic, excuse me, environmental sustainability, but also with financial inclusion. And uh, we learned a lot through that process. We got a tremendous response from the market, uh, the lowest interest rates we've ever paid on a 10-year bond. Um, and, and, and again, BAML was a, a key advisor for us throughout that that process as a leader in this field. Uh, and I think hopefully it sets a demonstration case to other companies about how to use this interest in inclusiveness, in sustainability, to help incentivize uh, companies to, to, do, to do the right thing. Thank you so much. And I believe that our short, medium, long-term paths as, as corporations and as individuals definitely have very, very significant uh, crossroads. So we, we definitely uh, share many, many views that are um, similar. Thank you so much. So Sherman Humphrey um, has a question, and I'm going to read it. As we confront transformative political, economic, social, and technological change in the pandemic and post-pandemic environment, global organizations and communities have had to evolve in order to preserve business relationships, manage risk, and maintain profitability. 
Have you perceived a shift in priorities at MasterCard to accompany these changes? Has the relationship between business units and external state stakeholders changed or shifted? Uh, yes, I think there's been an evolution. And I think as these issues have gained more and more attention um, by investors, by stakeholders, by governments, um, that kind of feedback to the company has also helped sharpen our focus uh, on this uh, on, on this as well. Um, again, it's such a part of our broader business strategy that um, it's it, this isn't something that's done off on the side, uh, you know, an office of doing good or anything of that sort. It's deep, deep, deep into our DNA now and across all of the the, the business units, and so. Um, it's really the, the the feedback that we've received from the markets and external stakeholders really has helped sharpen our focus, um, but it's already quite deep uh, in in the company as a whole. Now, look, I'll give you, uh, you know, one example that that, that, uh, uh, that relates to this. Last month, we signed a uh, a five year uh, agreement with the, the president of Panama to help Panama uh, digitize and promote inclusion. Uh, in the country. And so, you know, with that kind of external feedback, working with a government, working with the president of the government to say, this is a priority for us and we want MasterCard to be our partner in helping to deliver that, that sends a very powerful message throughout the whole organization and really helps to marshal resources. Thank you. She, uh, Sherman also had another question, which I think is kind of uh, interesting. What is your perception of cryptocurrency to the MasterCard uh, business model, is it an opportunity or a threat? <laughs> Look, I, uh, I think, as I said, we, we, are, we view ourselves as a multi-rail company. And um, uh, we are, I believe, the number three holder of, of, of patents in blockchain, uh, the, in terms of the company with the most patents. Um, so it's something we've been involved in for a while. Um, it, we're monitoring the developments there. We created a, a sandbox for central banks to experiment with central bank uh, digital uh, currency. So we're very active in, 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 that, in that market, but we also do it from a, uh, a position of certain principles, including that it's got to be very much consistent with regulatory frameworks, um, a level playing field that everyone can participate in, and it's got to be pro-consumer. There's got to be consumer value associated with it and that's very important for it to be sustainable over time. Thank you. Great answer. Um, Igor uh, Ziadulki, um has a question. Michael, what kind of knowledge do you believe will be necessary to work at strategic levels in 10 years, such as VPs or directors? What do you think will change? <laughs> uh, I don't I don't have a crystal ball on that one. I, look, I think um, there certainly is technical knowledge that is going to become increasingly uh, useful and being able to be technically literate um, as we are becoming a more and more digital economy. But I tend to think um, the, the question is about the, how to be a strategist in the future and, and succeed in business. It's more the, uh, the soft skills. It's the being able to connect dots between different disciplines, being able to see around corners, uh, being able to uh, try and understand major trends going on uh, in the world. Uh, and then, of course, knowing what you don't know and being willing to ask people who are much uh, more expert than you are in any particular area, uh, all the questions that you need to know in order to be effective. Uh, so I, I wouldn't worry about finding one particular set of knowledge. I'd really worry, I'd worry, I'd focus on developing the set of skills that I think make you an effective strategist and an effective leader. So Maria Ines Bakwe asks, what is your view on digital identity as an enabler for the digital economy? Really important. Uh, you know, you've got over a billion people around the world who have no foundational identity. And uh, particularly as we become more and more digital in our interactions, being able to have assurance that you are who you say you are 
um, that you are engaging as you say you're engaging. That is really, really important. Um, I think there's some pretty fundamental issues around digital identity that need to get worked out. Uh, you can, uh, there, there are some approaches that take lots of biometric data and put it in a single database and, and you know, hope that no cyber um, criminal is going to attack and, and steal it. And if you lose your biometric identity, it sounds like you can replace your, your fingerprints or your irises or, or anything else there. So I think it's really important that, that digital identity systems be built but be built with privacy and protection uh, in their design. Um, for example, we've got a digital identity uh, system in, in Australia right now that we're piloting um, where we don't hold any information. We simply um, ping the relevant databases, whether they're government databases or private databases, and give you a yes, no answer. You know, I, I use the example in the United States that if my son wants to go buy alcohol the person behind the, the counter is going to ask for his driver's license. That driver's license has his middle name, it's got his birth date, it's got his address. The person behind the counter doesn't need to know that information. They just need to know, yes, no, is he over 21? And creating a digital identity system that protects the privacy of individuals, that minimizes the sharing of data, that is uh, not, uh, that does not create vulnerabilities to this to the cyber attack to me that's going to be absolutely critical if people are going to have trust in it so you mentioned cyber attack and um you know maybe that's the 21st century warfare um you know how do you protect your clients how do you protect yourselves how concerned are you um you know being on the board of the bank banks are hit all the time um, and I'm sure MasterCard is as well. Um, so how do you see, how concerned are you about this going forward? How do we get this under control? What, what's your view on, on, on cybersecurity? Well, it's a real threat and, and we, are, uh, we are very concerned and, and for a company like us, of course, uh, we are a trust network. And so uh, we, we invest billions of dollars in our own cyber protection and then in the services that we provide our our customers uh, to help them protect them from cyber intrusions and so it's absolutely critical and i you know i know that the biden administration just issued an executive order last week on uh, on cyber a lot of really good things in there and initiatives a real commitment to address those uh, those issues but every company and every government needs to be keenly focused on this and um, you know, we can help in terms of one being able to spot cyber attacks as i mentioned earlier our ability to see transactions all over the world because of the free flow of data from uh from one market to another be able to identify those patterns uh be able to help our clients protect themselves do the diagnostics to assess their vulnerabilities and and their readiness to be digital players and then provide them with the kind of protection they need to 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 uh, to prevent those attacks from having serious effect. Is this a public-private partnership? I mean, obviously, cyber and protecting companies and individuals from cyber attacks has to be someplace where the public and private sector work together, no? Absolutely, absolutely. Look, there's been some good uh, good work done in the past. Uh, uh, our CEO was on a commission that, that was started near the end of the Obama administration on cyber uh, on cyber security a lot of good ideas came out of that um, to make it possible for companies to share information about the cyber intrusions they were seeing uh, with governments and with their uh, with others in their sector without uh, recrimination of uh, training people we have a program the cyber readiness institute we have a, a fellowship program with microsoft and, and workday to help put people into government to, to get expertise on cyber and then bring them out of government and find places for them in the private sector so that there's a, a real understanding from both the public and the private sector about the nature of the threat and what can be done about it. Has, has your view on um, cyber security and, and, and the security you need around the digital economy, um, has that changed as a result of the pandemic and the dramatic increase um, in digital uh, transactions and 
the whole absolutely absolutely look i think it's underscored just how important it is particularly as small businesses go online you know they may not have all the cyber protections of a large company or of a government and so making sure that they are not vulnerable to cyber attack you know as we see more and more of the economy becoming digital and that was, was accelerated by covid it also has accelerated the importance of taking action on cybersecurity as well. We talked about India. We talked a little bit about Latin America, but we are seeing, um, you know, a number of challenges in Latin America, a number of, you know, challenging elections that are challenging, in a sense, the core of the establishment of, um, and in some ways, the economic model. Um, do you have a... Do you have any comments on on kind of where Latin America is? I know that's not what we're going to talk about, but I think it's in a sense it will impact everybody's business because in some countries these elections are are questioning um, things like private pension systems and and you know economic empowerment, et cetera. Not about the elections, but about what this right. what, what these outcomes are telling us, right? that we should be concerned about? Globally, we've seen over the last several years um, uh, various political trends of populism, nationalism, nativism, protectionism. Um, it's not limited to any one country. It's not limited to any one uh, region of the world. It comes, it shows itself in different flavors in different places, um, but uh, there, there clearly is, um, uh, there clearly are concerns in the populations of a lot of countries. And those concerns get expressed through this. All that to me, that all that, that very much underscores everything we've been talking about, just how important it is that we focus on inclusion and coming out of this crisis, building back not only better, but with more inclusiveness, more sustainability, again, being very intentional about it um, because the, uh, However, it's expressed politically. Uh, what we're finding is if people are feeling financially insecure, they're going to find a way to express that through the political system as well. And so we all need to make sure we're doing everything we can to create a system, modify a system to ensure that it works for everybody and that the benefits of, of trade, the benefits of economic development, benefits of economic growth are truly shared and widely shared. So that stimulated another question from the audience. Marcos uh, Samaha uh, asks, social and wealth inequalities between countries and within countries were already huge, and the pandemic has made them even greater. Are ESG and stakeholder capitalism making a difference effectively? You know, I think we're in still very much the early days of ESG and, and the the evolution of corporate purpose and combining purpose with profit. So I think it's too early to, to make a judgment. I, I think the good news is that uh, the sentiments of CEOs and of boards, I think is real. I think that they see that this is really critical, um, um, both as a social good, but also critical to the business over the long run, that so action be taken to address these kinds of issues. Um, I think translating those very good intentions and those sincere intentions into action is the next stage. And we, you know, we're involved in a number of different organizations from uh, uh, a UN group of CEOs that focus on financial inclusion um, under the sponsorship of, of Queen Maxima of the Netherlands um, to the Edison Alliance, uh, which is a group of companies that have come together, and companies, governments, and nonprofits who've come together to really focus on digital inclusion and ensuring that uh, there's both the infrastructure to bring people into the digital economy, but also when it comes to health, education, and financial inclusion, we're doing all that we can to, to build out uh, those capabilities. Uh, I think there are more and more mechanisms for helping companies figure out how to have that kind of impact. And so I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that uh, we'll see more and more concrete activities that begin to have that positive impact that we're all looking for. Thank you. I hope so. I think it's so important. So as we finish our conversation, 
Um, I'd like to ask you a question on leadership. Um, what advice would you give to leaders um, in their efforts to drive their business su successfully while also, also benefiting their stakeholders? And has your view on leadership changed over the last year? Hmm. Um, look, I think what's really important is that uh, leaders find their own authentic and genuine way of going down this path. Um, for us, it started with financial inclusion. It's broadened out somewhat from that, but it, it feels to all of our employees, our 20,000 employees, it feels authentic. It's something that they can relate to. It's something they can tie to what they do in the rest of, of, of the business. Um, and that will be different for every company. And so um, finding ways to bring the assets of the company, including your people, to the table in a way that is authentic and genuine, to me, that's the only way that a leader can ensure that it's going to have a long-standing commitment. I think making it part of the broader corporate strategy. It can't just be philanthropy. It can't just be CSR. It's got to be something that permeates the corporate strategy so that it's not, when there, there will always be pressures when there are downturns, when there are um, uh, financial crises to cut back on things that don't produce revenue uh, you know, in, the, in the immediate short term. If it's part of the corporate strategy, then you can maintain that consistency uh, throughout. And then the third thing I would say, as I mentioned, is you know, you, you 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 manage what you measure, and uh, you, right. <laughs> you you met, and you and you compensate what you manage, and so um, ultimately incentivizing your people to take this as seriously as you do is really critical, and that means in our case linking executive compensation to very not just general ESG but very specific metrics that they can have an impact on. So we got one more question, even though we've already talked about leadership. Okay. Sure. Okay. So um, this was from the live stream, actually. And what do you think is the best strategy to massively implement credit cards into low income users in emerging markets? In other words, how do we get more credit card users um, in emerging markets to the I guess D and E population. Well, look. I think uh, uh, first we've got to find ways of including them into the formal uh, financial system, and it may not be a credit card, it may be a debit card, it may be a prepaid card, it may be something else. But getting them uh, into the system so that they can receive and make payments safely and and securely, um, uh, helping them then that's a first step towards savings towards buying micro insurance, so towards uh, investing, towards getting a loan. Um, and you know, one of the great things about, about the emergence of data analytics is that we have a lot more data available to help uh, assess the credit worthiness of an individual. You don't have to just look back on whether they were able to get a loan in the past and pay it back on time. Uh, you can look at the cash flows, you can look at behavior um, and you know with AI with data analytics you know we we, we, uh, we recently bought a company in the United States called Finicity which has a great capability of helping people boost their credit scores uh, oh, that's great uh, because you can see a broader range of of, uh, of information and so you know using all those tools first to get the individuals into the system and then to put them on a path towards greater financial security. Well, with that, I think our time is over. Um, this was a great conversation. Um, I've gotten actually feedback in the chat while you were speaking about what a great conversation um, this was. So I want to thank you um, for joining us and invite you to come back uh, and participate again. Um, I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to host uh, you at today's um, Bravo Leadership 
conversation. And frankly, I hope to see you in person very soon, <laughs> Mike. It would be just Likewise. wonderful to go We're back. We're probably only a few miles away from each other. But we'll we probably are. So I look forward um, to you. having lunch or something with you and, and, and seeing you in person. Um, and to all of our viewers today, um, I hope to see all of you in person. And I want to wish you um, a, the very best. And please uh, stay well, stay healthy. And I shouldn't say this, but get vaccinated. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Mike, for spending thank this you. hour with us and giving us your wonderful views. Thank you. Thanks so much.